Joseph. Joseph. Joseph Bernard. Joseph Bernard Miller. Although okay. I think it's, I think they probably said Bernard. Bernard. Okay. Yeah, but that's what he puts on all his labels and his ah. instruments. Joseph Bernard Miller. Okay. Uh, everybody called him JB. Okay. He was born in 1902. He was born in uh, um, Owen County. Mm. Grew up in uh, Gratz okay. in Owen County on the river. His family had a big farm. Mm -hmm. um, and he was one of 11 kids, I think. He was down near the bottom of the stretch, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, he was very recognized by his family and people around as mechanically adept. Yeah. So when they needed a single tree repaired or some kind of equipment around the farm uh, to be fixed. He was a good woodworker and just had a good mechanical sensibility about fixing things. Yeah. So there was a lot of fiddling around. Mm -hmm. uh, his dad was an old-time fiddler and he had an uncle that was an old-time fiddler. And uh, so the musical interest was there. Yeah. And he and his brother Bob played banjo and fiddle. I think they may even have swapped back and forth a little bit. Uh, and played at little parties around mm -hmm. in Owen County when he was a kid. So he was already kind of tying into a community of people around that play. Mm -hmm. So known as someone that could fix things, the postmaster, as I understand it, in Gratz, um, or in the vicinity, some postmaster there turned him on to a book that had come out called um, Violin Making As It Is and Was by Heron Allen. I have his copy right over there. I could get it for you and show you. It's just torn to shreds. And uh, it's the copy he started with. And uh, maybe I can get over there and pull it out for you and show it to you. It's just amazing to see it. Uh -huh. But I'm a little ahead of the story because what happened first was he had a brother that got married and he had his fiddle under the... Of course, this is how he told the story. And I hope it's true because it's too good of a story. But evidently the slats fell out of the bed on his wedding night and crushed the fiddle. Oh. Okay, because it was under, under yeah. the bed. And then there was someone else <clears throat> whose wife was the stenographer for the court. Uh -huh. And she had the stenography machine. Big heavy piece of equipment from what I understand. Sitting on a little spindly leg table. That, those were his words, spin to the little table over in the corner. And the guy had his fiddle all the way across the room, propped up in the other corner. Mm -hmm. And the legs broke on the table and threw that stenography machine all the way across the floor and right into the fiddle and busted the belly out of it. <laughs> so his brother and his friend, they bring these two fiddles with the bellies busted out of them and say, can you make us one fiddle that we can share? Huh. So he takes the back off of one, cuts the F holes out and whatnot, and puts it together. Yeah. So they've got a fiddle to play. That's where the postmaster got involved. Uh -huh. Okay. Because he saw that and he says, you know, you ought to check out this supply company in Michigan. It's VC Square, S Q U I E R, a uh, company in Michigan that had a catalog and you could get that violin making book from it. Yeah. And that's what got J.B. going hmm. on making violins. But he, uh, <clears throat> his first repair actually was on his dad's violin because his dad, he, he'd put his violin in the chest of drawers. Uh -huh. Not everybody carried around in cases and sometimes knapsacks or whatever, but it was in chest yeah. of drawers. And with a farming economy and farming life, you might go several months without playing and then think about taking your fiddle out. Yeah. So he pulled his fiddle out and a mouse had gotten inside it. And what mice do to a fiddle is they see that little opening yeah. and they say, well, if I just widen that out a little bit, and so they'll gnaw out a hole here around the F hole yeah. and get in there and make their nest. And that's what had happened. So he actually, his first repair was to trim out that gnawed out part of the wood and graft another piece of wood in, uh -huh. right? And then trim it down to shape and then varnish it to match. Mm. And I've seen that. It's he did beautiful work. Yeah. And so that was that was his first repair before he did the make 
one fiddle out of two yeah. exercise that he did. Huh. And I know when he when he really got interested in it, and he read the Heron Allen book is uh-huh. about violin making. Uh, he also went to um, a violin shop in Cincinnati. Went to Wurlitzer's, from what I understand. Oh, okay. And the guy behind the desk. Uh, let him go down stairs from what I picture he went down the stairs to where the repair shop was he says you can go down and talk to the repairman uh-huh. he went down and talked to him and and uh, he says he wasn't down there but about two minutes when the guy hollered down that's as much time as I can spare you <laughs> and so the repairman said look you're a barber make your living barbering because mm-hmm. You'll do better making violins on the side and barbering. And it was a big life decision for him to go ahead professionally as a barber and uh, do repair and violin making on the side. Yeah. And so he did until he retired from barbering in 1965, at which point he was communing with people from Nashville, Roy Cuff, and I've heard people talk about coming to his shop over on Stratford Drive and finding... Vassar Clements in there, or Kenny Baker, or mm-hmm. or uh, someone told me just a couple of weeks ago that they went in this shop one time. Guy brought me a violin to repair, and he, that he got from Mr. Miller, mm-hmm. and he said he went in there one time. And Roy Clark was in there, hmm. so he was good buddies with Roy Acuff as well. And yeah, there's a lot of Nashville scene kind of back and forth going on in the '60s, early '70s. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So he was he was. Repairing violins on the side, but making a living primarily as a barber. Mm-hmm. That's right. But then when he retired, he was able to shift that? Yeah, he, he went shift. totally into yeah. Yeah, the instrument work. He lived in Frankfurt, barbering in a big five-chair barber shop, and I think it would have been part of like a, a, a hotel near mm-hmm. the Capitol um, that he was in. Uh, and he worked 10 years in Frankfurt from 1923 to 1933. And, uh, but he was... For the last few years of that, um, from 19, he made his first violin in 1929. Mm, okay. And so from 1929 to 1933, he would travel to Lexington. He knew some people here because of his capital connections and the people he was shaving and yeah. doing the haircut for. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, that was back in the days with razors and strops and all that sort of stuff, too. Yeah. But he would come to Lexington on the weekend and pick up instruments from the symphony people here take him back to Frankfurt for the week yeah. and do his repairs in the evenings, okay. bring him back the next weekend, and he would kind of be in rotation doing repairs here. So he fell out of sorts with the guy who managed the barbershop there in Frankfurt, and yeah. so he just said, well, I'll just move to Lexington. Yeah. yeah. So that's what he did. Well, that's interesting. So he never actually formally studied with someone. No. No, it was just all no. on his own. No. He went to, he did meet uh, a very famous violin maker of the day, one of the finest makers in America. Uh-huh. was in northern Kentucky. His oh. name was Robert Gleer. Mm. And he told me about going to visit Robert Gleer and uh, and uh, that he invited him up and had dinner with him and his wife. And he, he was someone who pursued avenues to knowledge where he could find them. Yeah. That okay. way. There was a, a doctor in Lexington named Trapp who would travel the world to see famous instruments. And he had a photograph collection that I have over here too, I can show you, uh-huh. of instruments. Um, and so he got an instrument education about telling the difference between German, French, Italian instruments and that sort of thing, discerning yeah. instruments of quality, and about the history of the instruments from this uh, kind of amateur yeah. here in Lexington who was just really enthused about yeah. the topic. Well, that's a really interesting backstory.